Well, let's look together at uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. It's a great music, great presentation. I see that Brother Clay made his exit there for a moment. He mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago about uh, the Halloween candy, though we call it our uh, special uh, fall festival that we had, and he talked about the kinds of candy that you shouldn't have to eat. Nobody should have to eat, and one of them was that filthy, awful licorice. Man. Uh, well, I agree. And uh, so I ask anybody that had any of that to bring it to me and I would dispose of it properly. <laughs> and somebody left me some last week and I appreciate it and I want you to know it was disposed of properly. <laughs> no one will have to eat that licorice. I took care of it really, really quickly. Uh, somebody asked me one time, when you, you, when you were married, when you got married, was there any, anything at all that made you question whether or not you ought to get married to, you, to the wife you did? I said, only one thing, only one, and that is she likes licorice. <laughs> and people normally say, oh, you don't? I said, no, that was the problem. I do like licorice. <laughs> And I knew when I married her, I was going to have to share licorice every time I had it. <clears throat> And I did, and so some, she helped me dispose of that properly, and I do have to say I would have rather done it by myself, but <clears throat> she did get her share of it. Well, <clears throat> there's another kind of candy I, I, I'll tell you about. <clears throat> when I was about, and I'll date myself a little bit here, I, I was, when I was about the fifth grade, <clears throat> I went into the store where I bought candy a lot, right across, there's a Shell gas station right across from... Uh, Mills Mill uh, in Greenville there, <clears throat> and I looked in the candy counter there in the glass, and I saw a kind of candy I'd never seen before, <clears throat> okay? Uh, it was in a metallic-like package. It doesn't come that way now, uh, and it, uh, it said on it, sweet tarts, sweet tarts. I'd never, they'd just come out, <clears throat> and uh, they, they're in a little rolled up now. I think you get them on a long thing. They're rolled up together, but they came in a packet like M&M's, I'll really show, I'll really date myself now, okay? I decided I wanted that, and I would try it, and so I gave the man my nickel. <clears throat> and I got a pack of sweet tarts. But what captivated me about those is I thought, wait a minute, I thought Sweet and tart was exactly the opposite. I said, there can't be something that is both sweet and tart at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> and so I put one of those in my mouth and I bit into it. <clears throat> and I found out something can be both sweet and sour at the same time. Uh, there was actually a war going on inside my mouth to see who got control of my taste buds. <clears throat> because I was getting two very different sensations in my mouth. <clears throat> now that was because they put two very different types of ingredients in there, and those ingredients, when they came together, did not offset and neutralize each other. Both of them kept their same properties. Some of them were intended to make a very, very sour taste in the mouth, and some of them were to make a very, very sweet taste in the mouth. And so there was this battle going on in my mouth, and neither side actually won. Two different things brought together, two very different things brought together into one, and it created quite a confusion. Well, folks, that can actually happen in our Christian lives because we're going to look at a passage here that shows our Christian lives are made up of two very different kinds of things that are put together. And if we don't understand, and they neither of them lose their qualities when they are put together. And so therefore, we have some experiences sometimes that are very difficult for us to understand, but we can understand it if we understand what the scripture is telling us here. Look in 2 Corinthians 4, Beginning with verse 7, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. 
For we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, okay? struck down, but not destroyed. You, you see, the Christian life is made up of two very different components. And the scripture here tells us about both of these. There's a treasure and there's an earthen vessel, okay? And both of those go together to comprise the Christian life. It's not one, of the, one or the other, it is actually both. And the treasure is very different than the earthen vessel, and the earthen vessel is very different from the treasure, and therefore we have sometimes some very conflicting experiences that might be difficult for us to understand. I want you to notice, first of all, what this treasure is. I want us to call attention to the two components here. That's the treasure and the earthen vessel. And then I want us to see how those together affect us in our Christian life. And then I want us to see very quickly why did God arrange things this way. Uh, he has that in the passage, all of it, that is before us. There are two contrasting elements that make up the Christian life, not one or the other. There is a treasure and there is an earthen vessel. Now, what is the treasure? Well, it's easy for us to find that out because if you look what we said, it says we have in verse 7, we have this treasure. Well, what treasure? Well, the treasure that he's just been talking about. So if you look back in verse 6, you find out what the treasure actually is. God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, okay, <clears throat> is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us, and here it is, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That is the treasure that God has given to us. What we have is not just a knowledge of Jesus Christ, but it is an experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. Folks, those things are very different. A person can have a knowledge of Jesus Christ and it not be an experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. We can say it this way. <clears throat> It may be possible for a person to know a lot about Christ, and they don't actually know Christ. I remember one of my seminary professors telling me of when he was in, uh, when he was in seminary himself. He said he found an area of town that did not have a, a church, and as he started riding through it, he found out that there was a church building there that was closed. And he thought, well, maybe we just need to see about getting this building, this church uh, reinvigorated and going again. And so he asked some people in the community, and they said, well, there's one man in the community that if it's going to go or not, it's going to be up to him. You better talk to him. And so he said, I went to see him. <clears throat> and he said, I tried to encourage him. These people don't have a church in the community. We can use it as outreach. He was not interested a bit in the world in making any kind of move to bring the community to Christ. But he said, what amazed me a lot about him is that he knew an awful lot about the Bible. He knew an awful lot about Jesus, but he said he didn't give me any indication that he actually knew Jesus. Folks, there's a difference in having a knowledge of Jesus about Jesus and having a relationship with Jesus. Those are two different things. You see, we can give people a knowledge of Jesus by preaching, but I want to tell you, it won't give them a knowledge of Jesus in and of itself. Preaching cannot save people. Praying cannot save people. Jesus saves people. He uses instruments to do it, but folks, we can preach, as the old saying goes, until the cows come home. And that is not going to save a person. It can give them a knowledge about Jesus, but it won't give them a knowledge of Jesus. It doesn't bring an experiential knowledge. You say, well, what brings the experiential knowledge? Did somebody ask me that? 
Well, you should have. Okay, because I'll, I'll tell you what the experiential knowledge actually is and how it comes about. Look at verse 6. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness. Okay, He's the one who has shown into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. You see, the reason we need that is if you go back to verse 3, it says if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled from those who are perishing. They hear the gospel, but it is veiled to them. You can tell them all about Jesus, and they don't see the glories of Jesus. They don't see the beauty of his person and the hope that he has to offer. So what is the hope? Folks, the only hope for them is verse 6, that the same God who shined in, if you want to know what he's talking about, he's talking about in Genesis 1, that same God who one day when it was all darkness and God said, light, B, <laughs> and it was light. <laughs> he says, what has to happen in the heart is the same thing, verse 6, the same God that said light, B, has to shine into our hearts because we are blind and say to us and in our hearts, light, B. You remember when that happened to you? You remember when you'd heard the gospel many, many, many times, but it was veiled from you somehow, and God turned the lights on. You remember that? Uh, that? That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about an experiential knowledge of God, and it comes only in the person of Jesus. I remember hearing the story of a Sunday school teacher, or a Sunday school teacher telling a story of what happened in her class with little children. They had had the lesson, <clears throat> and then as they often do with children, they gave them crayons and things and said, draw a picture that has to do with our story today. And so as she went around looking at the kids, this one kid, she couldn't tell what in the world he was drawing. And so she just thought she would ask him. She said, now son, what are you drawing? He said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And she thought, well, here's a wonderful, teachable moment for this child. She said, honey, um, we actually don't know what God looks like. And he said, we're going to when I get through. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, friends, that is precisely what people were saying up until the time that Jesus came. We really don't know exactly what God looks like. And he said, you're getting ready to find out. Just look at me. Because if you have seen me, you have then truly seen the Father. The glory of that treasure is an experiential knowledge that comes in the face of Jesus Christ when God turns the lights on. Folks, you see why it's so important for us to pray along with the preaching and along with the evangelizing and to pray for our missionaries because they can preach and teach but we are dependent on God turning the lights on. Salvation is of the Lord, and it is a treasure. Why would he refer to it? And I, this could be somewhat of a rhetorical question again. Why does he refer to that as a treasure? Because, folks, it meets the greatest problem that we will ever have. The greatest problem that we have is that we are alienated from God because of our sins. There's a lot of different problems that I have, you have, and people throughout the world have, but there is none greater than that there are obstacles between them and God, and it is sin, and it comes to us as a free pardon. Folks, you can read stories of different cultures of how people understand that they are sinful, that they understand somehow in a vague notion we are under some kind of wrath of a being somewhere. And they, they take all kinds of steps to try to make some kind of atonement. Some of them will cut themselves with, with stones and knives to make themselves bleed to somehow pay the gods for what they've done. While there are some that have thrown their babies into the Nile River or the Amazon River or a similar river hoping to appease the wrath of some God that they have somehow offended. And folks, you know what? We've got the greatest news for them. You don't have to do that. 
that sacrifice is not necessary because God already sacrificed his son for us. And that greatest need that we have comes to us absolutely free. It is a free pardon from sin. That's why it's a treasure, and it is a treasure that is completely satisfying. Because, you know, most of the treasures that we think we treasure up and the things that we want ultimately don't satisfy us. And the scripture warns us about that. Uh, Christians through the years have warned us about that. If we could just get more, if I could just get a little more of this, if I could just get a little more of that, if I could just, then I will be satisfied. And you know what? We never get there. And the reason we never get there is this. God made us for something better than that. He didn't make us to where material things could actually satisfy the deepest longings of our souls. I read a comment by the, uh, the late Dr. Tim Keller just yesterday. He said, studies find uh, a very weak correlation between wealth and contentment. A very weak correlation between wealth and contentment. And that the more prosperous a society grows, the more common depression is in that society. That, that's amazing. After all the basic needs are met, things that human beings think will bring fulfillment and contentment actually don't. And they don't because God made us for something better than that. God has placed a Jesus-sized hole in the heart of every individual. And we will never have the satisfaction and contentment that we are supposed to have and that God designed for us to have until that is met with the only thing that can meet it, and that is the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that is going to fill that void. The great St. Augustine said it this way, Lord, <laughs> our hearts are never satisfied. And we never find peace and contentment until we find it in you. Folks, the glorious thing about the gospel and why it is such a great treasure is it is invariably satisfying. It's the treasure that will indeed satisfy. And fortunately, it's inexhaustible in its supply, you know. You know what's true of most treasures? They're limited, and that's why they're treasures. You know, one of the main principles of economics, you're aware, is the law of supply and demand. The more the supply, you know, uh, the, the demand actually then changes. If you have more and more of the goods, the price of it goes down. If there's only a few of them, that's why these first edition books are so important. You try to get a first edition, but because they didn't print many of those, and they're valuable. But the beautiful thing about the treasure in the gospel is it's not that way. It's not true that the more of it there is, the less value it is. It is of ultimate value, and it keeps being of value. It's inexhaustible. It's more like Jesus breaking that bread. You remember when he started breaking it for, and he just kept breaking it? You know, most of the times if you break bread, the more of it you give away, the less of it you've got, you know? But that wasn't the way it is with Jesus. With Jesus and his grace and the knowledge of him, the more of it he gives away, the more of it there is. This, this is actually inexhaustible in its supply. It is completely satisfying, and it's a great treasure because it's actually accessible to everybody. You, see, you don't have to have a lot of wealth to get it. In fact, you don't have to have any wealth at all. Isaiah 55, 1 says, come. Come and buy. And come without money and buy. You say, How do you buy anything without money? Because it's free. <laughs> Drink freely, he says. That's why everybody can, can receive it. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be of a certain gender, a certain race. You don't have to be of a certain socioeconomic uh, background. 
It's something that everybody can have. Folks, that's the wonderful thing about this treasure. That's one of the reasons that he says that it's a treasure. It's accessible to everybody. Folks, all the treasures in this world are not accessible to everybody. Okay, we need to be honest about that. You know, <clears throat> we say all people are created equal. Uh, our documents meant they are equal in their freedoms before God. Folks, everybody is not equal. <clears throat> okay. Uh, a lot of people are born with a lot of opportunities that other people do not have. And they are somewhat limited as to what kind of, what all they are going to gain in life. I remember being with one of, at one of my um, deacon's homes one time. He had a very nice home. He owned several buildings and he was showing me his backyard. He said, I caught some kids, you know, from another neighborhood. He said, I could tell they weren't dressed real well. He said, they're climbing over my fence and they were getting my apples. And he said, I just stopped him and told him. I said, look, y'all can have some apples. But he said, let me tell you something. Why don't y'all just make up your mind you're going to work real hard and make a good living, and you can have a house like mine. And, 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 you, can have, and you, can have, uh, you can have these trees on your own. Well, folks, I, I have a real hard time interpreting exactly what he meant. Now, if he meant, let me encourage these people to go out and do the best you can do, you know, make something of it. Folks, everybody ought to be encouraged in that way. But folks, we're deceiving people. If we think the treasures of this world are going to be distributed equally that they ever could be, you know, th this man had opportunities that he was born with that those boys didn't have, okay? And they're never going to have them. Now, do they need to strive and struggle and do the best they can? Absolutely. But they're not going to have the advantages that he had. My father worked hard two jobs all of his adult life and he was never nearly as wealthy as this man so let's don't fool ourselves about the riches of this world they are limited the socialist will always want to tell us well we can make everybody equal just remember what George Orwell said about that yeah everybody will be equal but some of them are going to always be more equal than others that's the way it's always going to be, folks. That is because material treasures are limited, but the knowledge of Jesus Christ is not. It is a treasure that is accessible to all, and that's probably why we should look at it as the only true wealth in the world. That, that's the wealth that the individual found. Remember the parable, the little short parable of the treasure in, that he found in the field that he finds this treasure, and what does he do? He treasures it so much that he goes and sells everything that he has to buy that one field. And folks, that's the way the gospel is. It is the greatest treasure that we could possibly have. And we have it in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, folks, that's part of, that's part of the Christian life. And that's, that's really the good part. <laughs> but, but there's another part. He says, notice, we have this great treasure <laughs> in earthen vessels. Some translations say clay pots. Either of those translations is okay. Uh, Paul probably had in mind being in Corinth. Corinth was known for making these little um, clay, that's what they are, clay pots. You'd love something you could put a candle in. But they were extremely fragile. They were probably the kinds where the merchants wrote on there, you break it, you bought it, you know. And sometimes all you had to do is pick it up and it broke, you know. Very fragile. And Paul probably looked at those and thought, you know, that's the way we as human beings are. We're just fragile, you know. We're easily broken. Uh, we, we, we have got problems, and, and folks, we, we, we do. Uh, I can testify. We're aging, okay. Uh, there's a downside to that. We're not as strong as we were. Bones are more easily broken than, we, than they were. We can't see as well, hear as well. But worse than that, folks, because of these earthen vessels, we are susceptible to temptations. Folks, we have shortcomings, that, limitations. Because, folks, that's what makes the incarnation of Jesus so special, among other things. He didn't have any of these problems until he took on a human body. And then he began to have the same pains and heartaches and sorrows and temptations that we have, yet was without sin. We have the treasure in the earthen vessel. 
Those two are together. Now, folks, true Christianity, I want you to see, is both of these together. Sometimes we have the wrong view uh, and misunderstand our situation because, you know, we got these two parts, and one's experiencing one thing, and one is experiencing another, and we don't know what to make of it. Sometimes we have the wrong view of holiness that if somehow I could just get rid of this earthen vessel, you know, if I could just get rid of it and only have the treasure, this thing's giving me the problem. And, and, and I'll try to show you some ways in which that, uh, that happens. But folks, Christianity is not getting rid of this body. It's having the victory that God gives us in Christ in the body. Okay? You say, well, I could just get rid of the body. Well, folks, one day you will for a short while. But you know what? We talked about a resurrection. You're going to get it back. You know? Most people don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the resurrection. Most people don't have an eye. They just think I'm going to die and go be with Jesus. Well, you are. But what about the resurrection? You're getting your body back. You know? Now, it's going to be a completely redeemed body, but there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. Okay? Our, our bodies are not going to have the limitations. That they have. Not going to, but the fact is we're going to have them because they are part of who we are as human beings. We are people that are embodied, and God plans it that way. And he gave us this knowledge of Christ in our bodies, in who we are in this. That's what Christianity is. Now, let's try to flesh that out. Let's think about what I think one way we can do this is think about, well, some of the things that maybe Paul said even here. Uh, you look at, look at verses 8 and 9 and see how, how Paul, he, he's talking about he's got this treasure and in the earth and vessel, so what kind of experiences does that lead to? Since I've got both these very conflicting things, it seems, into one, notice he says, well, I'm afflicted in every way. Folks, that's because he's got an earth and vessel, <laughs> you know? That afflicted in every way, it, it's sort of a picture here of an, of an opponent, a wrestling match or something, a hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they've got you in a corner. That, that's basically what this says. Afflicted on every side. Just hemmed in on every side is what it means. But notice what he says. I'm afflicted, but I'm not crushed. I'm not defeated. You know why? Folks, you know why when you're afflicted, you're not defeated? Because it's the earthen vessel that's afflicted. You've got a treasure deep inside that is not affected in any way. So he says, I'm sort of hemmed in on every side. We could say it this way. Boy, I'm between a rock and a hard place. I'm just in a mess. But notice what he said. But I'm not crushed. I'm not completely restricted. He says we're perplexed. Perplexed means I'm in a mess and I don't know the way out. You ever been there? You ever been perplexed? You ever been in a situation, thought there isn't any way out of this? Well, that's because we're still in this body here. But notice what he says. But I'm not despairing. That means... I'm perplexed, but I hadn't given up hope. You know why? Because there's a treasure deep down inside there that is unaffected by what's going on in that body. He says persecuted, hunted down. You remember how Saul hunted David down? Paul hunted Christians down, okay? He says, I, we're persecuted, but notice what he says, not forsaken. I have not been abandoned to the enemy. Friends, your earthen vessel will tell you sometime, I think God abandoned me. <laughs> okay, I do not feel God anywhere close. You ever been there? You know, God, where are you? <laughs> well, we've got this earthen vessel here. But he says, we're persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. You see, there's the conflicting elements that are in this Christian life. Why is it that we have one of these things and we also have the other and they seem to be in conflict with each other. Why is it that we seem to have victory and defeat because we have an earthen vessel but we have a, a, a treasure that knows nothing about defeat? Think about our own Christian lives. Uh, well, you can think about, think about I, I don't know of a better example than, remember when Paul was it at Philippi, got the church started there before there were any believers. You remember he and Silas were beaten and, and then they were put in the dungeons? And what did they do? They started singing. 
and they start praising God. And you know what people thought? You people are crazy. We just beat you within an inch of your life. And you're in the, they said, yeah, 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 but y'all don't understand. <laughs> you see, that was the earthen vessel that got beat up. That's what got afflicted. You didn't afflict this great treasure that we have that nothing can take away. That's how they could have those kinds of experiences because the Christian life is made up not of one thing, but of two kinds of things. Folks, that, that's why we can have, we, we can have uh, a, a divine power in the midst of our weaknesses. See, a lot of people say, if I could just get rid of my, my human weaknesses. Friends, God put his knowledge of Jesus in you as a weak human being. He knew you were weak when he was doing it. In fact, that was his plan. You know why God uses weak people? You know, because that's the only kind he's got. Because people are weak. Every one of us have weaknesses. But that doesn't mean that there cannot be a divine power in us that works in us that gives us our victory because the Christian life is not simply victory. It's having victory in the midst of a human weakness. That's the way God intends it. You say, well, if I could just get rid of the human weakness. You're not going to get rid of the human weakness. The divine power is going to manifest itself in your weakness and in my weakness. That's what the Christian life actually is. Because you think about doubts. Well, because I'm in this human flesh, I have all kinds of doubts. Yep, we sure do. But you can actually have faith in the midst of doubt. You see, in fact, faith actually demonstrates itself when you're in situations that are conducive to doubt. Okay? The reason we can have, that we have faith is because we get in situations because of our humanity, we get into doubting situations that lend themselves to doubt. But the fact is, the beautiful thing is, we have faith in the midst of doubtful situations. That's when faith comes, okay? I, I remember a story of, uh, from the great uh, 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 preacher and, and uh, uh, really ran m m George Mueller, known more for anything of, of uh, running these orphanages. And he had an orphanage, one of his, had, they had absolutely no food for, the, for breakfast the next morning. And he just always said, we are going to live by faith. And the kids came down for breakfast, and they sat down at the table, and he thanked God for the food that was not there. Okay. And when he said amen, there was a knock on the door, and there was a catering service that had the wrong date for a catering event, and they had made some food and didn't know what to do with it, so they brought it to the orphanage. Now... Notice the situation was very conducive for doubt. What are we going to do? But you know what he did? He chose to have faith in the situation that did not lend itself to faith. Faith is actually having a faith in the Word of God in the midst of a situation that is conducive for doubt. Folks, we can see the same thing with heartache and joy. You know why we have heartaches? Because we're in this body. Things happen to us as human beings, and there is heartache. I think about our missionaries. They're just an example of people. I, I, I think I know of some of them. We have many of them stay in our home. We have some that, that stay in our home, or their kids do on somewhat a regular basis. Folks, they're halfway around the world. Now their children are here. They're in school. They're married. They have grandchildren. And they almost never get to see them. Do you think that's a heartache for them? Sure it is. You know, but Jesus didn't say, didn't he say anybody who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom? Well, yes. But he didn't say it would be wrong to keep one hand on the plow and wipe away the tears with the other one. And that's what many of them do. How do you find joy in the midst of heartache? Because there is a treasure in us that nothing can take away. And when we see the value of it, it, is, it overwhelms any heartache. I, I remember look, having to look at this on my own one time. 
I remember a, a former colleague of mine several years ago when I was explaining to him the mess I was in. He listened to it like any good brother in Christ should, and then he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Brother, don't let it rob you of your joy. I thought, Did you hear what I just said? What do you mean, don't tell me? How can I not? And you know what? I said, I better start thinking about that. And then I understood, as I thought about it, exactly what he meant. He meant this basic same thing right here. I'm not saying you don't have heartache. I'm saying don't let it rob you of your joy because your joy comes from that treasure that you have in Christ that nothing can take away. Folks, that's how we can have victory even in the midst of temptation. You see, we're tempted because we have this earthen vessel. We're tempted because of that. Okay? It, it, it lends itself. Jesus was tempted. But you see, the way we can actually have victory even over that is because there's a treasure that's inside. There was a dear, precious lady that was a, a member of, of my church where I preached. She was deaf. She couldn't hear a word, but she was there every service, and she could read lips pretty well. But she would tell me a lot of times, she'd just take my hand, she'd say, Preacher, I'm just the worst Christian there's ever been. I said, why, do you, why would you say that? And she said, if you just knew how much I was, I was tempted. And I knew exactly what her problem was. She was confusing Christianity. She, did not, she thought Christianity was the, the, the treasure. How, if you have the treasure... Can you ever have any doubts? Because the treasure is in an earthen vessel. And so I said, well, let me ask you something. When you have all these doubts and you have all these temptations, how does it make you feel? She said, it makes me feel awful. And I said, well, that's a sign that you are a child of God. That when these things come, you turn against them and you reject them and you turn to the source of that joy and that is your treasure and that you do have victory over temptation because we God has given us victory not out of temptation he didn't say if you'll become a Christian I'll give you I'll get you out of all temptation he never says that he says I'll give you victory through the temptation you're gonna have the temptation because it is in your own being it is part of who you are because you are in part an earthen vessel. Now, why did God do that this way? So God couldn't, you, and here's, you know, God could have had several reasons for doing it, you know, I, I, but he, he does tell us at least here why he did it. Look, look in, uh, um, at the end of uh, verse 7. He says, so the, great, the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of us. So, it would demonstrate God's power and our weakness. When we go through these conflicting issues here, what does it show us? It shows us we are weak, but he is strong. I am a clay pot, but he is a treasure that indwells me. And you know what? That makes sure he gets the credit. Folks, you see, if the power was in us, if we were the ones having the victory, we were really overcoming by ourselves. You know how we'd be. We'd be strutting like a peacock. Well, we'd, we'd, be, we'd, we'd just be patting ourselves on the back. And God says, no, there's not going to be any patting of yourself on the back. Because that gives you the credit. And he says, the credit is due to me. You remember the story of Gideon in the Old Testament? How he was going out to battle and had all those soldiers. And God thought, you know. If he goes out there and wins this battle this way, he's going to think he's the greatest thing that ever happened. So we're not going to do that. He says, we, we're going to get his army down to where he doesn't have a chance of winning. It's going to take a miracle for him to win. And that's exactly what he did. You know, God got that army down to 300 people, and he still routed the enemy. And so you know what he had to do? He had to say, God, that was all you. <laughs> All glory to you, buddy, we didn't do that. And friends, when we have that earthen vessel, and when we have that treasure inside that enables us to overcome, then we are truly able to say of him, glory to you. God, may you have the glory. You know, the Bible says something else about vessels. 
it's actually the same word that appears here that, that Paul uses in uh, writing, to, uh, writing to Timothy. In fact, it's the last, uh, the last epistle that he writes to, uh, to Timothy. He uses the same word. He says this, because he says, this, you say, what are we supposed to do with this vessel we've got? You know, what are we supposed to do with it? Paul tells us. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things and their sins that he has mentioned, if he does, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful to the master and prepared for every good work. You know what God does with that old vessel you've got? You know what he does? <laughs> he sanctifies it. He empowers it. He strengthens it. And he purifies it so that our vessels, our bodies, can be devoted to him as living sacrifices in his service. You say, but I'm awfully, awfully weak. Folks, weak people is the only ones God has. But I'll tell you, if you keep yourself pure, God can and will use you. And that earthen vessel will not overcome that great treasure, but that treasure will use your earthen vessel to bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for the grace and mercy that you have shown us in Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have allowed us to know about Christ. Lord, for many of us, it was from our earliest childhood. Lord, we heard in Sunday school, we heard in, in preaching services, in Bible school. But Lord, we thank you that one day, that light, the same light that had shone in the darkness, shined into our hearts that gave us an experiential knowledge of Jesus. Lord, and we came to know him as our Savior. Lord, we saw the beauty in his holiness. Lord, we thank you that you've worked that work of grace in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you that you have put that great knowledge in earthen vessels like us and that you use weak people like us in order that you might be glorified. So Lord, our prayer as a congregation of people standing before you today is Lord, help us to have pure vessels. Lord, if there is sin in our hearts that keeps that treasure from shining brightly to our world. Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Show us if there's any wicked way in us. And Lord, help us to be people that are vessels that are fit for the master's use. Lord, we're amazed and we are humbled that you would use people like us. But Lord, we are thankful that you let us be co-laborers together with you. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.